Okay guys, so I believe this is week six of the weekly sonnets here. And uh, this week I've decided to go with one of my own sonnets, okay? So it, um, yeah, yeah, that's that I, I write sonnets and uh, I just thought I would talk about one of mine today. It, um, I, I like I like practicing the sonnet form for all of the reasons that I've discussed in in previous sonnet talks. I also find that well, well, it's one of those things that it, it's it's good practice because obviously there are a lot longer poems both um, in the modern form, you know, kind of the free verse trying to do. It, uh, get trying to get away from rhyme and meter, and also in um, traditional verse. I mean, obviously, there's, I guess, to put it simply, it, it's not a very intellectual way to put it, but it's just there's there's a lot longer poems and stuff. But uh, given given the pressures of society and of the day and of family life and of work and all the things around one, I like the sonnet because. It's not a massive undertaking, but it is still, you know, it's, it's taking the time to sit down and put your thoughts together in an artistic fashion. And, and then you can get up and, and as little time as you may have in a day, you've had some time to reflect. Uh, and, and of course, it's one of those things when it takes a lot of tweaking to make a sonnet really work well as it would with, with any other point. You know, what, what you put into something is what ultimately others will be able to get out of it. And so, so it's not that, you know, a sonnet uh, takes less time to develop and hone uh, per, per square inch, per line, right? But it's still a more compact thing. You know, then, for example, setting out to write a short story or a or a book in in verse or something like that, right? Okay, so uh, one little note before I get started on this son of mine here. Um, as I as I was looking back after the talk that I did on the in on um on and uh, on the sonnet ballad. So the, the last, uh, last week's poem that we looked at, it struck me that, you know, as, as I was reading it, as I was talking about it, I said this is an Italian sonnet because you've got these two sections. You've got an octet at the beginning, the eight lines, and a sestet, the six lines at the end. And thank you, um, I won't mention the student, but, but thank you for like, reminding me that those actually have names. It's not just the eight line section and the six line section. It's an octet and a sestet, right? So, so thanks for reminding me of that. But, but you know, I, um, my gut instinct was to label that as an Italian sonnet because there was octet sestet with Gwendolyn Brooks's uh, sonnet ballad that we looked at last week. But as I was looking back on it, I was like, well, it has the rhyme scheme of a Shakespearean. Because you have that A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, that, that rhyme scheme like that. And again, I don't know if we've talked about rhyme schemes like that yet, but the first time a rhyme is introduced, if you're trying to figure out the meter of a poem, uh, the rhyme scheme of a poem, it would be A, right? And then the next time another rhyme is introduced, B. And then every time you come back around to one of the rhymes you've already used, you use the same letter. So, so a Shakespearean rhyme scheme would be like A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F. And then the last couplet, the last two lines would introduce a new rhyme. So those would be G, G, if that makes sense. But, but so as I was looking at that last poem we did last week, I was like, Oh, you know, this does have the, uh, it's got the octet, the eight lines, and the sestet, the six lines, so it's split up like an Italian sonnet, but it's also got that rhyme scheme 
the three quartets, the three sets of four lines, which rhyme within themselves, and the last couplet, which rhymes within itself. And that's, that's the Shakespearean sonnet. So it is definitely possible to mix the two forms together, the Italian uh, and the Shakespearean. All right, so all that said, let me go to uh, this, this sonnet that I've written that I'm going to talk about here. So this, uh, and, and again, I've got a link to it, uh, to a Word doc with the sonnet down below if you want to look at that. But the poem is, uh, is called The Groomsman. And it makes reference to Luke 14, Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 11 in the Bible. But I'll come back to that later. First, I'll just read the poem for you. So, the groomsmen. I hold this photo of my wedding feast. You seated at my bride's request at my left hand. So that amid our relatives, you'll feel yourself less like a misplaced beast. The one groomsman not of my family, arm linked with my kid sister, you walk down the aisle, now voicing your discomfort at your place of honor mid our panoply. Until I mention how, in Luke, the Lord advised his listeners to take the lowest seats as dinner guests and not the best, so that they might be noticed at the board by hosts who'd usher them up from below as you've been honored here among the rest. All right, so as I, um, yeah, looking at this, I, I want to read this, this Bible passage to you here that the poem references, Luke chapter 14 to 7, uh, 7 verses 7 through 11. So this is where Jesus is at a dinner party with a bunch of Pharisees, I, a bunch of religious leaders, and, and maybe some of the political leaders of, of Israel, right? So he's at a dinner party. And they've invited him there because they're trying to fill him out. Really, they're, they, they're trying to get him in trouble or something. You know, so they invited him over for dinner. But let me just read this passage to you. So this is Jesus teaching a bit as he's at this dinner party with all these rich people and uh, political and religious leaders. Uh, verse 7. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests. A parable is a story. He began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the best places out when he noticed that they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by the get may have been invited by the host. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this man. And then, in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the, less, the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So basically, Jesus has just been noticing this tradition in Eastern cultures, I guess, and especially in Jewish culture at this time, that when people are invited to a dinner party, to a wedding or whatever, you know, they would, kind of, they would try it. Some seats were more honored than other seats. So some seats were like closer to the bride and groom um, or, or the better seats. And so people would try and grab those seats because they knew if they were sitting in those seats, people would realize how special they were. But the problem was, you know, and Jesus is talking to them and he says, you know what, you, when you show up to one of these feasts, don't try and grab the best seats. You know, instead, take the lowest seat. And he explains, he says, you know, the host did have the prerogative, prerogative if the host, a friend of theirs, walked in or somebody they wanted to be the special guest, they could take them up to the head of the table. And if you were sitting there, they might be like, uh, dude, please get up because this person today has more honor than you. And then you're like embarrassed and humiliated because you got to go down to the worst spot because that's all that's left, right? And so Jesus is like, you know, when you come to a dinner party, don't try to put yourself first. Don't, don't fight for those best seats, 
He's like, sit down at the lowest spot. And then, you know, you might get honored. The host might come and be like, why are you sitting down here, you know? And the host moves you up to a better seat. And then you're not looked down on by everybody. Instead, you're honored by everybody because it's not the host moving you down. It's the host moving you up to a better seat. That last verse where Jesus says, uh, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The person who tries to put themselves at the best seat will be humbled, you know, will be in a sense disgraced. But the person who is willing to be humbled will be exalted um, but by God in this context. And so this poem is kind of referencing that as a way to talk about my own wedding which was back in, back in 2009, I got married. And so this poem is about something that happened at my wedding with my groomsmen. Um, but I'm also referencing this passage from Jesus. So let me read that. I'll read the poem again, and then I'll talk specifically about the poem. The groomsmen. I hold this photo of my wedding feast. You seated at my bride's request at my left hand so that amid our relatives you'll feel yourself less like a misplaced beast. The one groomsman not of my family, arm linked with my kid sister, you walk down the aisle, now voicing your discomfort at your place of honor amid our panoply. Until I mention how, in Luke, the Lord advised his listeners to take the lowest seats as dinner guests and not the best, so that they might be noticed at the board by hosts who'd usher them up from below as you've been honored here among the rest. So I'll just go through and, and pick this poem apart for you. Um, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm literally looking at a photograph as I'm thinking about this poem, as I'm, you know, working over this poem. You seated at my bride's request at my left hand, so that amid our relatives you'll feel yourself less like a misplaced beast. Um, so it was, you know, my best friend at the time. Um, he was, you know, he was at the wedding, and my wife, um, her, her father, had asked to throw a dinner party for us after we got married. And so we were like, sure. So at this dinner party with all my family, my cousins, uh, really everybody else was a family member. Uh, my best friend is here at this dinner, and he's the one person who's not related to me, right? And my wife, feeling like, you know, she, she wants him, I mean, for one thing, because we're the only two who know each other, right? But she, she doesn't want him to feel too out of place or anything, you know? And so she says, why not let him sit at your left hand? Because, of course, my bride, my wife, is at my right hand. But she, you know, checks with, um, she's like, let's let him sit at your left hand, you know? For, you know, and it's... I mean, it's kind of a place of honor at the groom's left hand, you know, or at the bride's right hand, so to speak. Um, and so my friend is sitting next to me, and he, um, yeah, and, and kind of to make him feel not as out of place, right? Or as I put it, to make him feel less like a misplaced beast. I remember when I was reading this, oddly, strangely enough, that I had in my, well, Partly feast and beast, like why do I call them a misplaced beast? Well, partly because it rhymes, you know. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's <laughs> that's one of those things of writing poetry, you know, just insider's note. Sometimes a word is there just because you're trying to make it rhyme, you know. And so maybe it sounds a little awkward or maybe it works perfectly for you. I'd be interested in what you think. Does it work to refer to my friend, you know, here, the only one, a non-relative, is like a misplaced beast, you know, like, kind of, um, but that's, uh, partly that's also there because it rhymes with feast, um, and, and it's weird because as I was writing this, I was thinking of the Grinch who stole Christmas, where they eat roast beast for dinner, you know, I've always loved that term, a roast beast, it doesn't tell you what kind of beast, it just says it's a roast beast, um, but yeah, so he's the misplaced beast at the dinner. The one groomsman, not of my family. Arm linked with my kid sister, you walk down the aisle, now voicing your discomfort at your place of honor mid our panoply. 
So he did, you know, uh, walking down the aisle and back, he was, um, yeah, again, he, I remember him telling me he just felt kind of awkward when he realized he got to the rehearsal, for example, and realized that my dad and my brothers were the other groomsmen, and my wife's sisters and one or two of my sisters were the other bridesmaids, and he was the only non-family member on the stage, you know? So he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, but I was like, it's all right, dude, you know? So uh, he ends up, you know, he walks down the aisle with my kid sister, who's uh, the youngest of my six siblings. I, I'm the oldest, of course. And, you know, so it was just one of those moments, right? One of those memories, seeing him walk up and down the aisle with my uh, kid sister. Um, now, voicing your discomfort at your place of honor mid our panoply. A panoply is like this rich parade. It's like it's kind of like a parade, like a display of glory. And so, as I'm writing this, I'm thinking all of us gathered together in this room for this celebration. You know, this semi fancy restaurant, right? And so it's it's like a panoply of people. This display, this royal parade, or whatever. You know. Um, so your place of honor, he's got a position of honor. He's at the groom's left hand in the midst, the midst of this panoply. And why do I say mid instead of uh, midst? Um, oh, or instead of amid. Amid means in the middle of. Amid or amidst means in the middle of. But why do I just put mid? Because of the iambic pentameter. Your place of honor mid our panoply, okay? Um, and this this all, you know, sticks to that iambic pentameter, the whole point. Uh, and then I, so that's your, your octet, the first eight lines there, and we're working with an Italian sonnet here of sorts. And then I move into the next major part of the sonnet, right? Uh, until I mention how, and so he's feeling kind of uncomfortable and stuff in the mix, and especially sitting at my light, left hand when it's like my dad could be sitting there, you know, one of my brothers could be sitting there, but he's there, and he's like, oh, this feels kind of awkward, and we're kind of having this little whispered conversation. I'm like, I'm like, dude, you know what? And I just kind of mentioned into his ear this story that we would both know about. I say, until I mentioned to him, kind of whispering, yeah, how, until I mentioned how in Luke, the Lord advised his listeners to take the lowest seats as dinner guests and not the best, so that they might be noticed at the board by hosts who'd ushered them up from below as you've been honored here among the rest. Um, and so I'm telling him, you know, remember that story, and it's like you have been given this place of honor. You've been brought here by the host, you know, by my wife and I. Um, and so this, this has biblical precedent, you know, don't be, don't be uh, shy about being here. Don't feel awkward about being here. There's biblical precedent to your being here, right? Um, to being noticed at the board, the board means like a board is just another word for a dent for a dining table, right? That's what people used to call the table where they would sit down to eat. They call it the board, you know, if you get room and board at a uh, hotel or a bed and breakfast. Room and board means you get a place to sleep and you get a meal. Um, so that they might be noticed at the board by hosts who would usher them up from below. Just like you've been honored here among all these people. You've been given honor, right? Um, and so that's the, uh, that's the poem. And again, mid-sonnet, it switches from just talking about the circumstances where we're sitting to the metaphor or the simile, as you want to call it, that six line simile where I compare the biblical passage to um, the setting that we're in right there at that dinner after my wedding. Um, yeah, going back over at some stylistic things, of course, there's the feast, beast, family, panoply, lord, board. And then um, you'll notice the, the second and third lines and the fifth and sixth lines do not rhyme. 
I just wasn't rhyming it, you know, which which isn't in line with the most traditional sonnet structures where the whole thing rhymes. But a lot of modern sonnets, people don't rhyme at all. So I'm kind of playing with it. You know, I rhyme the thirst, the first and fourth, the uh, fifth and eighth, the ninth and twelfth lines, and the thirteenth and fourteenth. Well, no. Um, so there's some rhyme there, but not all of it. Now, let's go to those last six lines, because I kind of mess around a little bit with this, you know, working out my, my rhyme scheme there. Lord and board, right? Lowest and best, and then, um, so advised his listeners to take the lowest. Originally, I had advised his listeners to take the low, and then a dash, and then the ist went down to the next line, so that low, the low, and below would rhyme, you know? Which, that works, it's okay. You know, between low and s, there's a natural syllable break, so it's okay to put a line there. But a friend was talking with me, and they were like, you know, from a contemporary uh, poetry perspective, modern poetry, people don't care that much about poetic structure. It's not a big deal that the rhyme, you know, so they were like, it just looks more natural to have Lois without a dash in the division between two lines. And so they were like, from a contemporary modern perspective, just put it together, you know. And interestingly, when that happens, you have S, you have lowest, best, and rest rhyming. And then your below is kind of left hanging out there. But, but you still, you get the idea. Um, so I wasn't being super strict with that. And when a friend was like, you know what, modern readers won't want to see that lowest split up. I was like, I'll just put it together then. Um, but so you kind of see the, the rhymes king playing through there. Um... Uh, a few other things that I notice as I'm reading this, that it's hard, like I wrote this poem uh, probably six or seven years ago, and so it's hard to remember some of what, what, what went into through my mind as I was writing the poem stylistically, but a few things as I'm noticing it that may have been intentional, um, especially as I went back and did revisions of the poem, like editing, because it usually takes me three or four days with a sonnet, for example, of constantly going back and looking at it again to really get it sounding like I want it to sound stylistically. Um, and so some things in here that may have been intentional that I worked out stylistically, um, let me look back over it. I hold this photo of my wedding feast. You see it at my bride's request in my left hand so that you'll feel, you'll feel yourself less like a misplaced beast. Those S and L sounds together. Less like a misplaced C is an S there. Beast. So that line, you know, I probably did go back and work on that stylistically a bit less like a misplaced beast uh, and just working for repetitive sounds to kind of make a poem to get more of the aesthetic feel going on right the one groomsman not of my family the M's there groomsman not of my family I probably went back and worked on that to get that line just right Arm linked with my kid sister, you walk down the aisle. Now voicing your discomfort at your place of honor mid our panoply. Until I mention how in Luke, the Lord advised his listeners to take the lowest seats as dinner guests. And uh, not the best. And so... Guests and S, the lowest guests, best... Kind of like a triple rhyme there. Guest is kind of like a rhyme in the middle of a sentence that connects with lowest and best. And so just a few things looking through it that I'm guessing, you know, at when I originally wrote the poem, it may have not have sounded like that, but going back and tweaking it to get some, you know, so, some sound repetition and stuff going on in the poem. All right, that's what I've got for you today.